Greetings. If you are listening to this audio right now, which I know you are, you have just shown that you are at least a couple of drops more intelligent than the person sitting next to you who is not listening. This is entitled Heads I Win, Tails You Lose. Call it quickly in the air. This title comes from a little trick I used to use when wanting to get something that I wanted, but I wanted to seem like it was only by chance and that there was a 50 cent chance that my victim could win also. (laughs) Now, those of you who already get it, you already understand, but I understand that there are so many more who still don't get what I'm saying. You see, if I come to you and say, want to win your car. And I say, I will toss this golden coin with a heads and a tails on it. And if I win the coin toss, I get your car. But if I lose, I give you $1 million. Now, a lot of people who are in dire financial straits would go ahead and take me up on that offer. Then as I flip the coin and call it in the air saying, Heads I win, tells you lose, call it. And if they say heads, of course, I win. But if they say tails, they lose. Now, if you're following me, they lose either way. See, people think they're intelligent, but they really don't use their minds that well. They put themselves in situations every day to their own detriment. They are their worst enemy. People like myself who use our minds have them out working for us all day long and they will work 40 hours a week and they will have the least. Those of us who do the least amount of work physically but use our minds 100% of the time have all of the riches. Now, that is not to put anyone down. Well, (laughs) it actually is to put you down because I would like you to join the ranks of the thinkers, the doers, not the believers and the ones who get done. I will draw most of the energy from a certain book. The book is entitled The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Now, he gives you 48 different laws that will dramatically change the way you see your life because he understands as we all do no matter how nice of a person you think you are you do need power if you don't have power someone who has power has power over you now I understand I'm going to get a lot of people who feel like that Jesus and God is at the head of their life but I will show you even in your own holy book that it is not so If you were truly following your God, Jesus, Jehovah, whomever, Allah, you will have power and you will not be powerless. If you are powerless, the devil has the greatest grasp on your life. Because those who are following the creator of the whole universe, how could they be slaves to a job? How can they be slaves to an abusive man? How can they be slaves to a woman who has your heart and is throwing it up under the bus every single day? That is not possible. So I assure you that God is not at the head of your lives as you think. Because the fruit will tell us what type of tree is grown in your heart and your soul. It is the tree of wickedness and vitality is all gone from your heart. That tree has drained you of all life and of all hope, leaving you into the nadir of despair. Many of you are sitting there drained as if you are the rotting flesh in a big vat of leeches. Now, of course, If you are content with being in that episode of the story of your life, 
by all means sit there, relax, and rot. If you are tired of being a victim to everyone else's whims, go ahead. Listen a little bit further. I will jump right into this book, especially using one of the first laws that I want to show you that's in this book, which illustrates why I am using someone else's book and not one of my own. Law number seven, get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit. Use the wisdom, knowledge, and legwork of other people to further your own cause. Not only will such assistance save you valuable time and energy, it will give you a godlike aura of efficiency and speed. In the end, your helpers will be forgotten and you will be remembered. Never do yourself what others can do for you. Now, I know that this doesn't resonate with a lot of you. You're taught as a slave to go out and work hard every single day and you will be rewarded. But if you open your eyes, yes, that is true sometimes, but most of the time it is not. Every job you've worked for the most of your life when you go to that job, there is no picture of you still there. Sometimes there may be. But I don't care how many hours you've worked at McDonald's. When you go into that same building 20 years from now, no one will ever know you even worked there. I guarantee it. No matter how many hospitals you've helped to clean, no matter how many hotels whose laundry you have watched, and of course, these jobs are definitely needed. And I am not putting anyone down who does these jobs. But it is time for you to also do these same jobs and understand your position. If you are using these jobs to put your children through college, then hooray, hip, hip, hooray for you. But if you are in these jobs and you feel like you can do more for yourself and you feel like you're in a dead end job and you don't like the way that you are being treated, you need to listen to this audio every single minute of the day and follow the laws just like you do when you don't want to run a stop sign and get a ticket follow these laws of life now this law that I just read to you I am utilizing the works of those who came before me and I am standing just like Isaac Newton said on the shoulders of giants it is not my duty to recreate the will. The will works just fine. People still need this information. My duty and my niche is to take this information that is already out here and re-disseminate it into the masses in a way that is very palatable for you. Because if it was just working for everyone, there would be no need to re look into this information obviously there are still millions and millions and millions of people out here who need and want more power in their lives and just don't have it so follow this law that Robert Green has just given to you it is an old law he didn't make it up which is why I'm using this first he himself has connected back to the ancients and found knowledge that they have not even come up with themselves. It's the same knowledge that keeps getting shared over and over again. Find things in your life where someone else already has a system set up and that's working and follow it to the T and it will work for you also. Give credit whenever credit is due, but otherwise you go ahead and take the credit yourself. Now, when someone asks you where you get the idea, you let them know. But you also let them know you found a way of making it better, of making it more palatable, for making it more efficient. Then it would be yours. And as Bruce Lee said, this is not his knowledge. 
if he gives the information to you and you use it, it is now yours. That is chapter one. Chapter two. Now, now that you see that it is very efficacious for you and advantageous for you to be able to use other people's knowledge and legwork to further your pursuits, you may need to know how to appeal to other people in order to get them to do something for you. Now, we go to the law number 13. When asking for help, appeal to people's self-interest, never to their mercy or their gratitude. If you need to turn to an ally for help, do not bother to remind them of your past assistance and good deeds. He will find a way to ignore you. Instead, uncover something in your request or in your alliance with them that will benefit him and emphasize it out of all proportion. He will respond enthusiastically when he sees something to be gained for himself. Now, this is very important. Most of the business books and business classes that I've had my entire career emphasize just this. When you're going to a business and you need money from them, when you go to an investor, do not appeal to them because you're doing such a great thing for the community. No one cares. They're not going to tell you that. But let's come back to reality. Step out of the matrix just for a second. No one gives one flying turd about what you are doing. They won't tell you this, but their actions and the way that they spend their money does. Look at where most of the money goes on this planet. It doesn't go to the homeless, does it? It doesn't go to different charities. Even though a lot of money gets there, a lot of that money gets there because it's a tax write-off. They are getting something in return. If no name is getting put on a plaque saying donated by the so-and-so family, that money may not have gotten there. Now, of course, we do know people do give in the dark. Meaning, there are many people who always have, always are, and always will give. Even though they expect nothing in return. But those are the minority of people. Those aren't most people. See... A lot of times when you go to different churches and when you see that red canister sitting out in front of the store, most of the time, the number one thing that makes you put money into it is that there's a physical person ringing that bell in the cold and you feel a little bit sorry for them and you don't want to keep walking by them because it makes you feel guilty. Any of you who have gone to a lot of churches that I've gone to, they make you get up and walk in front of the church, even if you don't have any money in your pockets to put into the church, or if maybe you just didn't intend to give to the church that particular day. They make you get up and walk in front of the whole church and at least touch the basket. Why do they do that? Because they are, are appealing to certain emotions of guilt. A lot of times we give because we don't want to look like the person that didn't give. So even churches understand this. They don't just say give. We don't care. Give what you can. Even though there are many who do. But there are many who will wring those pockets and get that money up out of you. Now this isn't godly. But this is war. They know how to get money from you. So when you are trying to get that person to help you out, to do the legwork for your pursuits, you must appeal to something that they need or want. Sometimes you have to give them money. Even if it's a minuscule amount, that is what you're doing at your job. They give you some chump change to keep you coming back to further them making millions. Then they entice you and tell you that it's secure. 
But if you were intelligent like I always were, I was like, how come when I'm ready to go and do something that's more advantageous for myself, I need to give them two weeks notice in writing to let them know and give them time to get someone else in my spot. Now understand this. If you really have a good business relationship, you do want to give people a heads up. But I have always had a problem when you get fired, you don't get that same courtesy, do you? You walk in, you use your card to, to clock in, and it just doesn't work. You are met by security, and they have your stuff in the box. Why is it that way? Because they are operating from the laws of power and you are operating from the laws of the powerless the victim so they understand something that you don't they're in it to make money they're in it to set up foundations so that generations from now their children will still eat most of you no matter how long you've worked your job will not be able to gift that job to your child but now I digress let us go back into this law. When you're asking for help, no one wants to hear, remember when I helped you that time? Somewhere within that conversation, they're going to find a way to show that, hey, well, they've already paid you back. But show them what they are going to get, even if it's nothing. They have to believe they're getting over on you. That's why you get so many sales papers in the mail. Whenever a business needs money, they don't beg from you. They have a sale. They send out coupons. See, you think that's when a business is doing its greatest, but that's actually when the business really needs your money. That means there's not enough people coming into those doors, but they are smart. They are operating from these particular laws of power. They understand that they don't have to beg you. They make it look like you're getting something. But they need you to come in and buy, buy, buy. So they entice you by making you think you're getting over on them. How many times have you seen a car commercial say, oh, I don't really want to do it, but I got to get rid of these cars. So we have to drop the prices so low, we're not even making anything. Do you really believe that? Do you? Do you think they're going to sell all of these cars and not make a dime? Does that really make any sense? But we believe it. Even if you know under the surface that they are making a lot of money. We still fall for it. We all go buy cars during a certain time of the year because that's when they lower the prices. They know you've got your income taxes and they need that money. But they don't have to beg. All they have to do is have a big sale and you fall for it every time. You must do the same. When you need people to do something for you, appeal to something that they need. Some people just have that need to have to help people up under them. So look like you're up under them. They don't want to help someone who looks like they're up over them. So give them that. Let them feel like they are the masters. Make it feel like that you really need their opinion. Let them tell them something like, well, you know what? I should have followed your advice. Now I'm ready to. I'm ready to go in this direction. I just need you to do this. I just need that money right now. You are right. You are the greatest. Your information is the best. And then they will give it. If you come to them appealing that you really know what you're doing, they're going to figure, well, you don't need their money then. Since you know what you're doing, why would they help you? You know, you need to understand that people have certain needs and wants. Give them something. Take them out sometimes. You don't have to give up the sex. Take them out. Take them out for coffee. You know if that person can't get a date or not. Go out on a date with them. Go out to a movie with them. Do something, even if it's the same sex. Some people just need to get out of the house, but these are the people with all of the resources that you need. Take heed to this. I'm not going to be lingering and also 
beat a dead horse as they say but listen to this over and over again and you will find some way to get what you need by looking at what people need and want chapter 3 now there are many of these principles and laws that I've picked up over the years as a latent learner. A latent learner is someone who can learn not just by experiencing things themselves, but by watching the lives of others. I watch people do things and I watch them succeed or I watch them fail terribly and I learn through their disgust. But this particular law I had to learn the hard way, which means I had to go through it many, 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 many times before I finally learned it. But of course, now I have mastered it. This is his law number four. Always say less than necessary. When you are trying to impress people with words, the more you say, the more common you appear and the less in control. Even if you are saying something banal, it will seem original if you make it vague, open-ended, and sphinx-like. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are going to say something foolish. This is very profound. The most intelligent people know how to say something with the least amount of words. Now this is how I used to be back in my dragon-like state when I was a young initiate into the martial arts. I really didn't hang around many people so I was very quiet and I always studied people. When people would see me in a class or in a lecture setting when they come to me, they always ask my opinion because whenever I gave an opinion, I used the least amount of words and every time it was so profound. But of course, I got older, started mingling and finally started getting into relationships with the ladies and found myself trying to explain things over and over again, speaking for hours just to learn finally that people really didn't give a damn. <laughs> you can speak for hours and hours and hours when someone else is emotional they're not listening and you make yourself look very foolish you keep engaging people who really do not want to change their belief system so if they think you really messed up but you think it is the opposite and you're trying to explain your case, it really doesn't matter how many words you use. You would have come out better saying very little and you would look like a king or a queen. Women, do not get loud and use that shrill voice trying to get your point across. It just doesn't work. You can throw a man off of his balance by saying very little. Same thing with us men. Do not get loud like a woman. I hate to say that, ladies, but that is an attribute that usually the female species has. And I understand it because we're more vocal and aggressive. We can get physical. A woman has to use other things other than physicality. But this is why we call this a feminine trait. But you women can control it and use the masculine side by saying very little. Call it positive and negative, masculine and feminine is just something we do for energy. So don't take it personal. If you're taking it personal, that means you're ready to stay a victim. If you don't take many of these things personal, you are ready to ascend to a higher level. Now let's go back into it. When you are in a situation where you are baffled you do not know what's going on it is okay to say hmm at this point in time I don't have the exact answer for this situation let me do some research and I will get back at you and I will have an answer for you 
That sounds a lot better than I don't know. And you, then you start explaining all of these haphazard and crazy reasonings and hypotheses that make no sense. And you already said you don't know. Why are you still talking? Shut up! Iwanu Gahana. That is Japanese. That means literally not saying is the flower. Iwanu not saying Gahana. Hana is a flower. Now what are they saying? That in our particular language, us who speak English, we will say silence is golden. Now I know a lot of us have seen that proverb, that idiomatic expression when we go to the movies, meaning shut up, people are trying to watch the movie. But also silence is golden goes back to something ancient. It really means that when you don't say anything, you can smooth over the situation. Like Iwanu Gahana means not saying is the flower. You put a flower out there to keep the peace. You put a flower out there to keep things happy. Flowers are very fragrant. Now, too many words stink like doo-doo. And they cause a very unhealthy, insalubrious, and sticky situation that is very hard for you to get out of. But if you wouldn't have said anything or maybe just a few words you would not have gotten into that argument you would have not put your situation in where you put your proverbial foot into your mouth how do these things happen when we start talking too much there's a certain point in all arguments where when you go back and look at that situation you're like i said oh, said nothing after this particular point after i said this this and this I should have called it quits right there, but I just kept going. I let my emotions take the best of me, and I said something that I really didn't mean. Or, that person, that very beautiful woman that we all have seen, but when she started talking, uh, she's a little bit irritating, a little bit goofy, a little bit too ghetto for us. But if she would not have said anything, she would have looked like Holly Berry. She would have looked like Beyonce or whoever. Hey, LaBelle, whatever woman is beautiful in your eyes. Same thing for you guys. You might look like Morris Chestnut. You might look like Denzel Washington. But when you start talking, you look like Willie Lump Lump now to the women. If you would not have said anything, you would not have let them know how stupid you are. She would have never known, fellas. And ladies, the men would have not known either. That you do not have a clue. You are clueless. But you would have looked very intelligent and mysterious by not saying anything. Do not speak out of turn. And do not speak on situations where you do not have enough information to add an adequate and healthy portion to that conversation. It is okay to say... I'm just listening right now. You don't have a clue what they're talking about. You don't have to tell them that. Just say, I'm just listening right now, taking it all in. Do not jump into conversations about things you know nothing about. And do not over speak when someone asks you a question. Because those who know can use the least amount of words to answer that question. Because they know. And sometimes to know means you know that other people do not understand. And why would you keep explaining physics to someone who hasn't learned how to count yet? Why would you speak in Russian to someone who only speaks English? But everyone else may not. I speak a little bit of a lot of different languages. It'll be foolish for me to walk up to someone and just start speaking Japanese who only speaks Spanish. That is stupid. So keep it simple, silly. Kiss. That's what K-I-S-S means. Keep it simple, stupid. Actually, is what it means. But uh, I have to be blunt with you sometimes. Keep it simple, stupid. Do not overspeak. Once again, always say less than necessary. You will look mysterious. You would look like you're in control 
you will look like you know what you are talking about even if you do not this was law four of the 48 laws of power chapter three chapter four law number three conceal your intentions keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions if they have no clue what you are up to they cannot prepare a defense guide them far enough down the wrong path envelop them in enough smoke and by the time they realize your intentions it will be too late I know and I know again a lot of you people who feel like you are good people you're righteous people this automatically for you sounds like something that you do not want to do it sounds like this may be a problem conceal your intentions that sounds like the devil that sounds like something wrong is going on but here's the problem with that when you use it in real life which you do every day if you worked at a store and you learn how much the products really cost what company you ordered the things from you know you'll get fired by giving that information to everyone you know when certain things are said to be on sale when they're the regular price they always are but if you told the clients that when they came into the store you knew you'd get fired and you have no problem concealing other people's intentions when they tell you to but when i say to conceal your own you have a problem with it you think you're being devilish but you're not you're being smart now i will repeat this many times because i have a lot of people who feel like they are righteous but they are not and they feel like they go by the bible but they do not because the bible says you must have the wisdom of the serpent and the disposition of the dove that means you have to know when to turn things on and off there is a time to be mr nice guy and there's time to be a little bit devious well you don't have to use the word devious but yes there are times that you have to conceal your intentions now let's go deeper let's look at different situations where this can be advantageous for you now you want to get a promotion but your boss has already said that there are no more positions available to next year what are you going to do about that keep bugging them asking them what exactly that could be done to get more money also you're going to keep bugging your supervisor for more time off when he's already told you that there will be no more times off for this month you've already used up all of your vacation days see you use a lot of these laws for mundane things see if you need to take a day off you're going to play sick uh oh was that a lie that you told but you do it if there was some place you really need to go for your child, but you know if you ask for a day off, you will get in trouble. You need to come up sick in order to keep your job. Now, you can be foolish if you like and ask and get fired and get ridden up for taking an extra personal day. Or you can just come to work sick, start acting like you're throwing up and be sent home. And it'll be a regular sick day that will not count against your number of sick days. Because they don't want you there infecting the whole office. See, that's what smart people do. I didn't say to do that just to go to a concert or to just take a day off because you don't feel like working. I'm saying that there are times when you need to conceal your intentions. You want that raise, work harder. Put out information in a way to where it looks like you're not even looking for it but you know you do expect it. Put out hints that you will go somewhere else. 
if the pay doesn't raise. If you don't get a certain type of schedule, man, you really love working there, but oh, man, you know what I'm saying? The, your, your children's school schedule has changed. You have to get there a little bit earlier in the morning. So if your schedule was able to change to coincide with where you have to get your children, man, you would really be able to stay at this job, but uh, if you can't get it to change in your favor, who knows what can happen. Sometimes you have to slyly put that out there. Now, of course, your true intent may be you just want to be able to wake up a little bit later. You're going to put in a nice, good, long day of work, but you do not want to have to rush as fast in the morning. And it will make you a better person. You'll be able to get the children there safely because you don't have to rush in the morning. You don't have to get everybody up an hour or two earlier if you can just change the schedule around from the time you have to be there and the time you have to clock out. That is your true intent, but you can't always put that out there. Also, there's a pretty woman that you want to get with. There's a handsome guy that you've been looking at all of this time. You can't always go up to a person showing your true intent is to take them out. Sometimes you may have to be their friend first, which is advantageous for you anyway. You need to know if they're crazy or not. You need to know if they are the type of person that is going to be a good friend anyway. Now, I don't like getting people out there to date because I really don't so-called date myself. But I meet so many people, I don't mind going out for some latte. I don't mind going out to go get a smoothie with one person or a group of people. If you see a nice movie coming out and I might want to check it out too, we can both go. We can go as one big group or I can go one-on-one. -on -one. I have no problem with that. I don't myself call it dating. I think people that are so-called dating are trying to hook up with someone. And me, I'm a king. I'm not really trying to hook up with anyone. I do as I please. I come and go as I please. I don't share my body with everyone and I do not share my knowledge with everyone either. But going out for a nice, healthy smoothie, checking out a new vegetarian restaurant, I can do that. I have no problem with doing that. Because if I find out that person's crazy there, I can still get a good smoothie out of it. <laughs> it doesn't mess up my life one bit and I still keep making money and selling books. I still keep raising my children and traveling all over the world having fun. As long as it doesn't mess that up, yeah, we can go out. We can go, we can go chill. I have no problem with that. But if you come to me the smart way, if you are trying to be my woman, if you're trying to so-called date me, you better not let me know that is your intent because I'm going to be turned off. I'm one of those type of guys. I'm too busy. I'm too serious. So for you looking for a person like me, in the form of a man or the form of a woman, you better not go up to that person showing that your intent is to be lovey-dovey with them because that's not what they're looking for. But that thing can happen if you go toward that with those intents not coming out directly. Sometimes take it slow. Act like that is not the thing that you're looking for. And I understand sometimes this thing does happen. Sometimes the people that you meet are so cool. They have so much going on and you didn't really think about looking at that person as a potential mate. But once you see them, you say, man, I can see myself with this person on a different level in a relationship like that. But don't put it out there too quickly because it will be shut down because sometimes even though that person may be thinking that a year down the road if you bring it up too quickly and show what your true intent was you would have just messed up that would have been a bad chess move and they will see your end game and shut you down once again to reiterate Robert Greene's law number four always say less than necessary I had to emphasize that one again because that one goes back into this one to law number three conceal your intentions use both of those laws together and you will be 
advantageous. Chapter 5 Law number 1 in his book Never outshine the master Always make those above you feel comfortably superior In your desire to please or impress them Do not go too far in displaying your talents Or you might accomplish the opposite Inspire fear and insecurity Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are and you will attain the heights of power now this is extremely important this is one of those things where a lot of people mess up especially those in the job situation who think that by doing their best all of the time is the best <laughs> all of the time it is incorrect Sometimes when you outshine your superiors, you make them uncomfortable. You make them feel like you're trying to outdo them. Sometimes that even works with your colleagues. If you are doing too much, now of course, unless that is your intent to outshine those on your same level, if you are making the people above you uncomfortable by showing too much, they may feel you are trying to take their jobs. Now, also, even in a relationship, be it a parent, there are parents who are jealous of their children. There are spouses who are jealous of their spouse. There are siblings who are also jealous of the other siblings. If someone is older than you by nature of age, they are your superior in most cultures. If you are the younger one and you are constantly outshining the older one, they may feel so bad that they may begin to undermine you and try to find ways to make you look stupid. Same thing in the job situation. If you are outshining your manager, they may feel you're trying to go over their head and trying to shine so bright that the people who own the company will start seeing you over them. And that is not always the best. You see, when you are shining so bright anyway, people will take notice and you must be able to turn that on and off. There are times you're supposed to outshine the person ahead of you, especially if you see that you may have a fast track to the owner of that corporation. But make sure you are ready because if that owner doesn't want to overstep the bounds of that manager and they go to that manager and say, what's up with that one? See, all of your history with that manager will come into play. What if, even though you're shining so bright, they really respect the word of that manager? You see, when you make that manager look good, they are more apt to speak highly of you. When you're making them look bad, they will speak very lowly of you. And they will put salt in your game so quick so that by the time that owner comes back again, you are no longer employed there. Even though I know you were taught to always do your best, always be the best and work the hardest at everything. See, a lot of these laws, I must go off on a tangent just for a second. You may notice that a lot of these things may go Against. They are diametrically opposite of a lot of the things that you have been taught. But the way you have been taught, the way that you believe and the way that you see the world hasn't been working for you. Now, a lot of you who have found success already know a lot of these things and can still take these laws of power and go even higher up in your status in life. But those of you who are at the lowest point of your lives, doing things that you do not want to do, being with people that you do not want to be with, and feeling in a way in which you do not want to feel, you need to take heed to many of these lessons. I know and I chose the ones out of the 48. Now, of course, I'm using someone else's book and I want you to please go and take heed to all of the laws of power in this book 
The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Go buy it. Yes, I am making lots of money off of this book and many other books that I dissect and disseminate the information for. But I am doing it in a way by which you still can go buy the book. But I'm giving you a taste, especially those of you who've never read the book. And for those of you who have, I'm giving you a different perspective. Now, if Robert Greene does not appreciate it and one day calls me and says, you're making too much damn money off of me, I will quickly show him that I used one of his laws of power. <laughs> and I am using the work and knowledge of someone else to make myself rich. And he's not the first that I've used. And he himself have used others before him. But we do it in a way by which we still give proper credit to those who are due that credit and I am taking the information and changing it around but I do want you to still patronize Robert Greene and thank him for this book and when we do the art of seduction you will see it is extremely deep and needed but we do need someone like me to digest the book appropriately and to disseminate the information to the masses in a way that you can take it in. Many people do not make time or have time to read a lot of these books. That's what I'm for. My job is to study all health, all knowledge, all law, all math, all science and give it back to you in a way to where you can take it in. Now, what does all of this have to do with this particular law, you might ask? Well, you see, I'm not trying to outshine Robert Greene. As you notice, I always keep giving him the praises. So that down the road, he sees that even though I'm making a large sum of money, from his material, I'm cutting it up just enough and using it in an educational fashion to make it legal to be able to speak on these things. I'm giving him the credit. I'm letting you know how to get his book, how to buy it. That's how you keep yourself off the chopping block. Now, when it comes time and I am selling millions and millions of books and I have a half a billion in my bank account, I can stand out as an emperor and proclaim my knowledge thusly. Until then, I must be wise. Even an emperor at that status is smart and wise to sometimes take the back road and let someone else get the accolades. And as you've seen in the other law, there are other times I will let them do the work and I take the accolades. These are the laws of power. And these are my reasons for sharing them. I want you to have power. Stop trying to outshine those who are your superiors people who employ you people who drive you around they may have a car and you do not you stop giving your advice even if it is correct to people who have something that you need you make them feel uncomfortable and you put yourself in a very bad position by which they may change their mind about giving you that ride to work they may change their mind about watching your children they may change your mind about giving you that raise, giving you that promotion, giving you that managerial request to go to another company and get paid more. You must always be wise to let people feel comfortable around you. Even if they do not know more than you, if they are in a superior status, Always let them fill it. And the more you do, they are more off balance because they will keep pushing you ahead and won't know why. 
take heed to this rule. This was chapter 5. Chapter 6 The law number in the book for this one is law number 9. Win through your actions, never through argument. Any momentary triumph you think you have gained through argument is really a pyrrhic victory. The resentment and ill will you stir up is stronger and lasts longer than any momentary change of opinion. It is much more powerful to get others to agree with you through your actions without saying a word. Demonstrate, do not explicate. This one is yet another one by which I did not get a chance or make a chance in my own life to learn this latently by watching so many other people's arguing and be lingering a point for so long just to be shot down or just to go backwards in their relationship. I too kept seeing this over and over. Thus, I did finally learn but I learned the hard way. This one is one that is closely connected to saying the least to mean the most. But this one goes a little bit deeper and reminds you that you should not argue. It takes two fools to tango in that dance that we call an argument or a fight. In this particular law, we see that when we obey it, people bend to our will without us bending them with our strength. You see, when people start to argue with you, you be the calm one and they will be thrown off balance because they are expecting you to trade words with them but just look at them not but do not agree do not say anything that makes them feel foolish use your own words to basically just say hmm well I choose myself to go in this direction don't use terms like you, 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 you. That is very argumentative. It is very aggressive. You don't have to be passive. You want to be assertive. That's somewhere in between passive and aggressive. Where you use feeling words, but you don't use the word you. You don't say, well, I'm not going to do that because I know you're going to act crazy. Don't say that. Just say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sit back, relax, and think of a better way. Then I'll come back and propose uh, what my diagnosis is of this situation. I will put forth another way of thinking about this situation. At this moment right now, I just don't have the answer. Just like saying the least in the other law to get your point across, this way you show with your actions. You go out and just do. Stop saying what you're going to do and just do it. If you see it, that it's causing a big argument and people are getting thrown off because they do not understand where you're coming from, arguing the point will not do it. But if you just do it, you build it and they will come. You've heard that before. Build it and let them come. See, when you're successful, you don't have to say one word. When you're making money, you do not have to say one word. Now you see, a lot of people may feel like I'm talking down to them, but I have walked that lonely road of being broke. I chose to no longer walk that road ever again. I always keep money now. I don't have to carry it in cash. Only broke people do that. I keep them in banks and in real estate now. That is the smart way to be. I can now give more at church. I can give now more to people on the streets. 
and don't have to think twice about it. If there's someone I see who needs clothes, I can buy them clothes. If they're standing on the side of the road, it will not hurt me to buy someone a brand new tire for their car. And if they need it towed to get off of the highway, if I see a family there and there's no man present, I will put that money out there and she does not owe me a thing. It is my duty to show that yes, there are men out there who still will take care of women even if there is no sexual exchange. Pay it forward. Take care of these women, take care of these children. Yet, if we don't, they will be the same ones that will be terrorizing your whole family later down the road. That same woman you could have helped today will be that miserable wife to your brother tomorrow. That same child who you rolling up your windows tight while you just got out of church and you know you're about to spend some money on a big vat of chicken grease. But you roll up your windows because you don't want to put a little quarter into his bucket. I don't know what he's doing. He might be lying. So what? I don't care if he is lying. So what if he's wearing the same basketball uniform all year long? Maybe he's just hungry. But he knows that you won't give one dime that he's hungry. So at least he's dressing up and playing the part. He's using the, the roles of power. Give up the quarter. When you see people are hungry now if they're going to use drugs with it now you will know if you see people's eyes aren't looking right i'm not talking about that i'm talking about children out there starving i'm talking about men and women out there starving and freezing when you put yourself on the road to real power and money you don't have to be rich per se but you should have enough money to give the more you give, the more you will come. And I am one of those ones. I don't just give to anybody anyway. I give to people who look like they will give to someone else. I give to people who look like they're not going to break in somebody's house. I don't give to people who look like they're going to smoke it up or drink it up. I give to people who look like they can still be a very productive part of our society. See, you still have to be smart, people. You don't give to everybody. You can't give everybody a ride. You get your head busted wide open. Now, all of this to say, let's look back at this law. This particular one is about winning through actions. You see, you don't have to argue about giving. You just give. You don't have to argue about making money. You just make it. I used to argue so much with people trying to get them to understand the different ideas I had. I was doing this back in elementary school, selling things to my classmates. I saw that they liked my pictures. I came back to school the next day with that same notebook full of pictures and every single page had a price on it. And I sold every single page in my book. And for those who like certain pictures that somebody else bought, I asked them if they wanted me to draw them in that picture. I saw I had some money making ways back then. And I still do now. But the average person is not ready to think on that level. Not in elementary school and not at this age now. And I am almost 40 years old now. People still are the same as they were when they were five years old. For the most part. If they didn't see it then. They may not see it now. There's entrepreneurial spirits. But I'm here to show you that. You can always become whatever you want to be. So. Before I leave this one. Never forget. Exactly. What this one is all about. Because we all get caught up in this one. When we want to argue. Do not argue with people. Show them. What you're talking about. You don't have to push the point lyrically and with your words, push the point with your actions. Just get it done. It may be a little harder, but I guarantee you, once you do it, they'll fall in line. And if they don't, then they weren't going to help you anyway. But when you start doing the right vibration of people will step up and do it with you. Everyone who's a real doer wants to follow another doer the rest just talk
This was chapter 6. Chapter 7. This law in the book is numbered law number 10. Infection. Avoid the unhappy and unlucky. You can die from someone else's misery. Emotional states are as infectious as diseases. You may feel you are helping the drowning man, but you are only precipitating your own disaster. The unfortunate sometimes draw misfortune on themselves. They will also draw it on you. Associate with the happy and fortunate instead. This is another one. Wow. This is one I had to keep going through. Because a lot of us have that point inside of us that turns on when someone needs our help. We sort of get off on it, helping people, which can be a good thing. The problem is when you look deeper into this law, you understand how a lot of bad, wicked, silly things happen in your own life. Because some people just do not need to be helped. Or maybe you're not that person who can do it. You see, when you start reading this book, and please go get it, he's going to go deep into a, a story about a woman who, I'm not going to go in deep into it, you have to get the book, but you're going to see that there was a certain woman in Europe that a lot of high-class arist aristocracy wanted to be with. See, herself, her, her whole life was going downhill. And no matter who she got with, their lives started going downhill also. And one particular person was at the head of state. And the whole statehood, the whole country started going down because of one woman. There was something about her that just made you want to be attracted to her. She was a little beguiling. She knew how to turn a man on, how to talk to a man. And she used that. But there was something about her that just kept bringing on calamity after calamity. And whoever is around her at that time, their life is also going to go down. And you know what? After your life goes down, you will see that this woman kept going to the next person. If people would have seen deep into her psyche and just listen to her story they would have seen that something was wrong with her she came on the scene she was already married to someone but when you see the story she got married to a whole lot of different people after that it starts off with her being married and leaving her husband and she's meeting all of these men they never asked the question you know what's your background where you coming from you know have you been married before and she just kept leaving bodies <laughs> everywhere she went. Now, you may not meet somebody this dramatically devious. But even in this case, this woman wasn't devious for herself and in and of herself. It's that she just brought misfortune wherever she went. She just wanted to be a better, I believe she was a dancer, a singer or something. But she just wanted to perform. She just wanted to make money. But man, the way her vibe was always brought on destruction. Now, when you allow someone who is clinically depressed into your life, you're a happy person. The first thing you notice is at first it seems like they start waking up. It seems like you're really helping out the situation. But some people are just so used to being depressed that even though... It seems like you're helping them. After a while, they go right back into depression. And you're trying to wreck your brain to figure out maybe there's something I can say. Maybe there's a place I can take this person. Maybe I can introduce them to another group of friends. But there's something about this person that is just replete and they ooze and exude depression. 
and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, it could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a loved one. It doesn't matter. It could be someone you just met. And you have to understand that before you come up as da-da-da-da, Captain oh captain save them, you must understand that there are some people who just cannot be saved. And if they can, it's going to be on some higher power than yourself. They're not going to bring God down, but you're not God. You can be brought down. You can be made to feel depressed. And you're a happy person. And you can't understand why whenever you're around certain people, your whole mood just goes down. Whenever they call, uh, how you doing? You're like, man, why did they call me? I ain't even call them. But they call me and I'm asking hello and they're, oh, hey, how you doing? I'm just saying, you're like, yeah. <laughs> because misery truly does love company. And before you give out your number to everyone, and I don't care if they are family members, don't pick up that phone. If it's something truly important, they will leave a message. But a lot of times, it's something that you don't want a part of. Now, it's different when someone who's usually happy, usually has things going on, and their tire goes on flat. See, it's different. They call you, you go to hook it up. Y'all can even laugh while you're helping them fix the tire. But that wrong person you pick up the phone for, you're not only trying to help them fix that tire they don't have the money to get another tire they don't ride around with a spare in their car so they not only need a jack they need you to drive them around take them to work take their children to school and help them go find a tire now they don't want to go and get a real tire from a real store they got to take you to one of them round the backwoods places to get a tire that won't even fit they can't find the right you just messed up a whole day because you thought you were going to just help someone fix a flat because you didn't understand that their whole life is flat flatlined and anybody around them are going to experience that same thing if you jump into the water to try to save someone who is drowning you better think twice you must look at the situation sometimes you need to just go get a big stick and pull it out there I hope they grab onto it and you can pull them back in. That's using your brain. Because if you jump in there and that person's not that right type of person, you're both going to drown. You both will drown. No matter how much you want it to save them, you can't save everybody that way. Sometimes you have to throw that little lifesaver out there and say, grab on. That's smart. See, they're not going to pull that little dinghy down they're not going to pull the lifesaver down that long hook that you're reaching out over the water toward them let them grab on that now if they try to pull you into the water you can let go you can let go of it then try to get another long stick because if they did that just think what would have happened if you jumped out into the water and tried to let them get on your back or if you try to pull their arm and think you're going to pull them ashore, they will grab you and grab your neck and you're going to think they're literally trying to drown you. That is the nature of that person. They are like that in many aspects of their lives. Now, the rest of this law teaches you do the opposite. Hang around people that make money. They're going to talk a certain way. That's what I did. When a rich man told me a long time ago when I started spouting out these things that other broke people told me about money, they looked at me like I was stupid. Who likes being stupid? I don't. They said, why do you get advice from poor people? They said, we, we don't do that. We don't get advice from people who make less than us. I said, damn, that makes a lot of sense. So I don't do that anymore. If I want to be happy, I hang around happy people. And see, if you're the one that's depressed, happy people won't even want you around. And you'll check yourself. You say, uh-oh. And they'll tell you, hey, you're spoiling the movie. You say, oh, I'm sorry, guys. And you will let the vibe of the happiness bring you back up. Because they will dismiss you immediately. And you must have the heart and the wherewithal and the leadership and the power to do the same. Stop hanging around depressed people. Stop hanging around people that are sick 
all the time. I'm not talking about there's a congenital disease, but people that always just like being sick and snotting and, and throwing up everywhere because they don't want to eat right. Don't hang around them. That is this law. Take heed. Chapter 7. Chapter number 8. The law number in the book is law number 16. Use absence to increase respect and honor. Too much circulation makes the price go down. The more you are seen and heard from, the more common you appear. If you are already established in a group, temporarily withdraw from it. That will make you more talked about, even more admired. You must learn when to lead. Create value through scarcity. Very, very deep. Now, he used a couple of terms that you should hear and know about in using supply and demand in economics. The more of something there is in circulation, even in the marketplace, that means everybody can get it at any time. The price goes down. It's cheap. You can get it. Anybody can get it. If a Mercedes was easily obtainable to a bum on the street why would somebody pay thousands of dollars for it if a bum on the street can get it for a quarter <laughs> why would you pay more for it if everybody drove the same car how can they sell that car for a whopping price see the second someone comes out with something different that car is the most expensive car the same thing works in life with people so this particular law you can use it in your world. You see, you just met that woman of your dreams. Ladies, you just met that handsome guy, that knight in shining armor, that tall, dark, and handsome fellow. You finally got them to go out with you. Things are going great. You've been seeing each other for a while, for about a month, almost every day, talking on the phone for hours. You're seeing them every day. I gotta see this person, I gotta see this person, I gotta see this person. But then you notice that one of you begins to look at the other one a little bit funny the next time. See, I was in this situation in many different points of my life with family, friends, and with women. And I'm that type of person, I have to be the king. Don't give me that face that looks like, oh, it's you again. Uh-oh. See, I understand this law. You won't see me for a long time after that. Even if that person didn't say it, if I think they felt it, you may not see me for a couple of years. See, you're going to miss me. Because I understand the power of that. See, I understand that if I keep showing up whenever you expect me to be there. If I come over at your house every day at 3 o'clock at a certain time, if they hear the doorbell ring and it's 3 o'clock, they will just open up the door and won't even ask who it is. I know it's you. Come on in. And if it sounds like that, I will purposely turn around and walk away. I will make you understand that, oh, you better ask who it is. You don't know. I might change my mind. Whenever somebody thinks they know you, that's a problem. That's another law we're going to go into a little bit later. But this particular one, you need to make people miss you. See, it said if you're already established in a group, there's no need for you to be there all the time. You ever notice when there's a big group of people and someone's not there, they're missed? Where is so-and-so? I just noticed he's not here. Oh, no, he's doing this now. They start talking about the person that's not there. That's the person who is the subject matter. Now, sometimes they can be saying something negative about that person, but a lot of times it's not the case. Have you seen so-and-so in a while? No, I haven't seen him. I've seen everybody else, but I haven't, he's the one we all haven't seen. What, what is he doing? I, I heard he uh, has a new job. I heard, oh, he, you know, he's dating this woman. They're about to get married. Well, for real, oh, yeah, I heard he's doing a lot of traveling. You can make it to where it's positive stuff they're talking about. But see, when you're always around, there's no need to talk about you because everybody's caught up. On what you've got going on. Which pretty much amounts to nothing usually. It doesn't have to be. But that's how it feels. When you see people all the time. 
Now, I was in a situation. I went over a friend's house. It was a lady friend of mine. Been knowing her for some years. She needed a little help remodeling her house. And I'm a painter by trade also. So I went in and helped her remodel the kitchen. And once it was done, it seemed like she still wanted to mingle and chill a little bit. So I kept coming over every single day after that. But after about a week, I noticed I would just come up without her calling. And she was cool with it for a while. But one day I looked in her eyes and she had that look on her face like, oh, it's you. Like she was hoping it was someone else. Now for me, I was like, okay, do you want me to be here? And people don't always say, well, actually I've seen you enough. They don't want to say that. So they'll act like, oh, it's okay. Come on in. But I can feel that difference. And see, for me, I have a problem with that because I understand that's not power. I operate on a mantra of power. I come from a paradigm of power. I come from a status of power. Even in a friendship, there was nothing going on. But this was a friend, a lifelong friend. But I saw that we had seen each other so much during that time that we were remodeling the kitchen that afterwards she even thought it was cool. Why don't you just call, come over? You know, I don't feel like, you know, we were just working all the time. So go ahead and come over. But after a while, I noticed that something was gone. See, when I came over the first time to remodel the kitchen, she thought of me because she hadn't seen me in so long. And she knew that I did housework. She knew I can put in a new kitchen. She knew I can come up with designs and help her remodel her whole house. So she thought of me. Different people that she saw every day that she knew did this thing. But she thought of me because she hadn't seen me in so long. So even though I can do the same things that they can do, I got the money because she also wanted to see her old friends she hadn't seen in a while. So I also made money off of not being around all the time. But the second I saw that she got too used to me being around, she hadn't seen me again (laughs) in a long time. And it was about a year before I saw her again. Now, you don't have to wait as long as that. But you also do not want to be in a situation where you are taken advantage of. Even though there's nothing she was doing, I know you're taking people take advantage of your presence also. They get used to you being there. It no longer is a positive thing. I, when I saw that in her eyes, this is somebody I really love as a friend. Somebody I've known for years, but I knew I had to change it up. She was too used to me being there. We spent hours decorating her house, getting her kitchen right. And then for that week afterwards, it was just too much. I was over there every day. Then once I saw in her eyes, like, um, you're still here? Because you don't know what's going on in people's minds. They might have some other company they want to bring over. Do they feel like, uh, that's right, he's coming over. So I don't I feel uncomfortable about inviting. They don't want to tell you. So you have to do something before you're told. See, if you wait until someone tells you, ah, uh, you just messed up. Because in the back of their minds now, they had to tell you to disappear. See, you should have done it on your own and you would have had the power. See, you met that new love interest and you're messing it up because you're there all the time. Now, if they ask you to be there, it's okay, but still, someone has to be that smart when they say, let's do something different. Let's do something different. Or let's meet somewhere else. Let's, Let's do something different. You don't have to do it too quick because they might think something's up. But you will both know when it gets to be too much. When that other person starts looking funny, you need to be the master, the master of power to know when to disappear. And those who have mastered this, like myself, you will always be talked about. What's Lorenzo doing? I haven't seen him in a while. Anybody seen him? Every now and then I'll just disappear for nothing. There was times where I just stopped calling home. When I was first went to college, this is a very good example. When I first went to college, my parents were like, I want you to call home all the time. When I did, they said, stop calling. <laughs> Especially back then, there were no cell phones. So there was very, very high phone bills for them calling, for me calling, collect. And 
I was just one city away, 30 minutes away. They said, you're calling home too much. They put a block on the phone because I was calling too much. So I did them a favor. I rarely called home. Why don't you call home more often? <laughs> I'd rather have that than people saying you're doing something too much. You want other people to want you. You don't want to impose on other people. Keep this. Take heed. Chapter 9. The law that we're dealing with now in the book is Law 32. Play to people's fantasies. The truth is often avoided because it is ugly and unpleasant. Never appeal to truth and reality unless you are prepared for the anger that comes from disenchantment. Life is so harsh and distressing that people who can manufacture romance or conjure up fantasy are like oasis in the desert. Everyone flocks to them. There is great power in tapping into the fantasies of the masses. This is another one that a lot of people like to forget about. A lot of you out there who feel like, I just speak the truth. Well, that's just me. See, I just keep it real. Yeah, you keep it real bad for yourself. See, the people who keep it fantasy, everybody wants to be around that person. See, people already know the reality. And even if they don't, they will know it <laughs> because it's reality. They don't need you to keep reminding them of it. And see, see these powerful laws, laws of power, are for you to understand. Not for you to go out and try to preach the truth to everybody. There's a time for that. See, people who do that don't really get listened to. And there's a way to do it. You have to still provide the fantasy. You see, I study different businesses that still thrive during the Great Depression. Now, a lot of those things, when you study them, since we're going through a so-called recession now, it's not a recession for everybody because there's a lot of people, including myself, that's making this money. And I always remind people of that. You know why? During the times that it is the most economically distressful, people need fantasy. And whoever has it is going to get paid. You see, broke people spend a lot of money on movies be it bootleg or going to the movies. You see, broke people or even just somebody who wants to entice another person, you're going to be spending some money, partner. You want to entice that woman, you better buy her some clothes, you better buy her some shoes, you're going to take her out, but you will be spending money because women want that fantasy. See, women need to be talked to a certain way. That's fantasy. See, women need to be treated and they need to go to different places. Sometimes they need to go to a restaurant, not the regular Jack in the Crack, not the regular McDoodle Burgers or whatever different fast food restaurant you want to take them. Sometimes they want fantasy and you should want it too. You see, when you take a woman to a sit down restaurant, there's music playing. You can say, Garçon, um, could you have um, the violin player to play a tune for my lovey here because she's seen that in the movie she fantasized about a man doing that for her and the man who can provide her that fantasy will always have power over the man who does not if the most you can do is take your woman out to the store and say uh, you can get a banana and get a <laughs> you're gonna make smoothies at home you know there's a time for that but that person who can say going to take you to a restaurant, it can still be vegetarian. It can still be healthy. It doesn't have to be the, the, the different meats and squids and stuff like that. Whatever fantasy that you want is still fantasy. Sometimes you have to do something out of the ordinary. And you will notice people gravitate toward you. That's why people like comedy. Nobody wants to listen to the news all day long. I used to be one of those guys studying all the grim facts 
numbers about the slave holocaust and all the different war on the planet people don't want to hear that and he used to eat me up because I was like oh they're just not being real they don't want to live in reality of course they don't want to live in reality but you know what they are alive so they are living in reality there's a way that you have to spoon feed people you better make some fantasy up in it because too much of the truth is too acidic and it will burn a hole in their stomach and they will have a psychological and spiritual ulcer from all of that deep distressing news that you keep pouring down their throat and they will hate you for it even if it is true but the person who can provide the fantasy <laughs> that person is going to get all the money they're going to get all the loved ones they're going to get all the dates whatever it is you're looking for that other person is going to get it you see even going back to the job situation if you're looking for a certain status in the office the person that can provide the fantasy and make everyone in the office feel like a king and queen that's the person who's going to be there that person who can make that boss feel like boss you are the greatest I don't know what we would do without you even though you know in your mind they are incompetent but you will be the one that's still there you don't have the kids but but you can provide a certain type of fantasy to make them think they're really in charge even though you might be doing all the work Hopefully you're there doing all the work and studying so you can start your own company or you're doing all the work so you can prove and show later on to somebody over your boss that, hey, I did all of this work. I need his job. But until that time, use this law to understand that people need fantasy. People need to get away. People need to be entertained. Divertido in Spanish and also diversion in the word entertain means to divert. It means to take your attention off something. That's why we have entertainment. Now, I use edutainment because I understand if you educate people, people don't want to be preached to and just talked down to. You can make this stuff entertaining. And people will get it. And people will buy it. That's what made me successful. When I used to just pour down people's throats and hit a lot of facts, people didn't want it. People don't care for that. Especially grown-ups that don't even like school. You got people out here that don't like to read. This is America. People are illiterate out here. People don't like to read. So I started making videos. I started making different audio discs. See, my books, you can pop in and it will read to you. See, people are busy. They don't make time to go out and read. And since they don't, they really don't read that well. It'll take them a year to go through a book and they're not going to understand it. But see, they can listen to this disc and play it over and over and over again. See, I'm giving you fantasy and reality at the same time. See, in these fantasies that I'm weaving for you, you can hear and understand the different images that I'm painting for you. That in itself is fantasy. But also, I'm letting you put yourself inside of these fantasies so that you can understand that you too can have power. And in that fantasy, seeing yourself in there, you can visualize it and I'm helping you to bring it into reality. See, that's a lot deeper than me just saying, stop doing that. Start doing this. Stop doing that. Start doing this. You should just stop doing this. See, if you're really a real Christian, your life should look like this. See, I'm helping you to walk up those steps. You have to understand the laws. See, back in the day, Moses talked about the laws. Even before he went up on that mountain, they had laws. They had a code that they had to live by. Without having some type of code, without having some type of law, there will be anarchy, chaos. The word chaos, see, I'm a brother, I like to study the ancient knowledge. 
way before there was any English, Spanish, French, or Italian, and all these different languages that we speak today, before those languages even existed. There was an ancient people who first started thinking. Now, even if we use the Romanized letters that we use today, K-O-S, cause, C-O-S, cause, where you get cosmonaut, where you get cosmos, that is the total entirety of everything in the universe that is unified and works hand in hand and tangent with each other to make a tall, thick, deep, cosmological balance. Now, you take a term that we use the Romanized letter A, which means the opposite of, and put that inside of the word cause, you get chaos. Now, you know where the word chaos came from. It is very literal, but it's also very descriptive because you can picture how they made that word. They took A, which means the antithetical absence of order and put that right in the middle of cause right in the middle of all of the mathematical sequences the, all of the mathematical algorithms that equal out into something harmonious on each side of the equation and they put some in there that doesn't make any sense and it messes it all up chaos now one day we can get a little bit deeper into the mathematics that even underlies chaos but that's a totally different subject altogether the main thing I want you to leave with with this particular chapter is to always remember to play to people's fantasies thank you chapter 10 in my audio book but law 48 in the book by Robert Greene Assume formlessness by taking a shape, by having a visible plan, you open yourself to attack. Instead of taking a form for your enemy to grasp, keep yourself adaptable and on the move. Accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. The best way to protect yourself is to be as fluid and formless as water. Never let and bet on stability or lasting order. Everything changes. Now, a lot of you may remember Bruce Lee talking about this. Now, a lot of us who like to philosophize and I myself am a martial artist so we're going to talk a lot about Bruce Lee every now and then when we speak he was an individual who transcended his art it was because of him that a lot of people here in the west wanted to even study martial art and he did it in a way that was not orthodox he came up with his own way and he talked about being water he said water is formless, like his style, fighting style. He wanted to do away with a lot of the traditional styles. He said, be like water. It's the strongest stuff in the world. It creates canyons, but it's also extremely soft. It can take the shape of a teacup or it can carve out whole mountain ranges. That's what water can do. It cuts those valleys between the mountains. That soft stuff that we drink and live off of, water. He said, be like water, my friend. He was right. He understood many of these concepts, many of these words of powers, because he had to do things that people just didn't do, especially as a Chinese man back in the 60s. Being on television with mainly, predominantly, Caucasians. During a time that they really didn't want anyone that was not Caucasian to be a leading man in any movie. So he had to understand a lot of these concepts. Even though he was superior in many ways, he had to downplay himself. But with this particular law, he was like water. He formed into whatever he had to form into in order to get his way. In order to get a movie made. And then, even in his absence, sometimes he left her and went back to China and made movies. 
then he comes back here and then they now they miss him in China he understood that he understood by being here at first they weren't going to give him a break a lot, of, a lot of us know from watching the movie that he lost that role that David Carradine got in Kung Fu, the series. He had to show them, okay, you're going to miss me. And he played the game. He formed himself into water, which can form into anything, any shape. It could be ice. It could be liquid. It could be as solid as ice. It could be liquid water, as we normally see water as. And it could also be a gas, as steam. It can come down as snow. It can do so many things. It can be tiny, tiny water droplets that we're breathing in right now. Tiny, tiny droplets of water that's in the atmosphere that won't be rain until it can distance upon a nucleus of dirt dust particles and some bacteria in the atmosphere that's where our rain comes from little bitty tiny droplets before they even become a drop have to condense upon a nuclei but when you're formless like water you can be all of those things that same thing that we see as streams in the ocean coming off of lakes and coming down mountains cutting out the Dreams cutting out everything and then we even drink it water is bad in a good way water is amazing now if you be formless like that you can do that even in your own situations see when you're formless people don't see you coming now a lot of people who saw that movie The Devil's Advocate remember Al Pacino's role even though he was the devil in this, it had a lot of nice scientific um, and psychological uh, jibber jabber in it. You know what I'm saying? But it, it was very good. It's very, I like cerebral movies that make you think. And he said, they never see me coming. Now, what did that mean? You could take it or leave it, but I think it's very profound. Even for those who believe that there's a devil in a, uh, a red suit with a pitchfork trying to stick people. You know what I'm saying? Even if that's your belief, I believe in the concept a little bit differently. But um, when you understand that there are people out there to try and to, to destroy you, people out there trying to destroy you, there are entities out there, be it spiritual or they manifest as higher powers and principalities or just family and friends. You don't always see them coming. See, when you stand there in a certain form, you take a certain stance all the time. People know you. They know what you like. They know where you're going to be at every single time. See, when you change things up, you throw people off. If someone was trying to physically kill you and you never come home the same way all the time, man, you're hard to catch up with. See, you're the type that's eagerly and quick to always jump into a fight if they wanted to set you up by having someone to fight with you and somebody was going to stab you what if you didn't get any arguments that day you're too difficult to pinpoint you will live longer that way even in relationships when somebody wants to argue with you some reason you come home from work and your wife just looks at and just wants to start arguing be formless don't take on the shape that she's normally used to seeing Sometimes counteract that if you're listening to all of these laws. You're not supposed to argue anyway. And you're supposed to say the least to say more. But even in this one, be formless. That means turn into whatever that situation takes. That's what water does. How can that substance that can fill up a whole ocean also fill up a little bitty cup? It can fill up a thimble. And it will take the shape of that thimble. Even those little bumps on the thimble, it will fill those up. It can fill up a capillary, something as skinny as that. The same substance that can fill up and look like one homogenous solid in an ocean can also take the shape of a little capillary. Those little tools they use to suck your blood up when they prick your finger, those little capillaries. That little glass thing that looks like a little tube that's too small for anything to get inside of. Water can get in there. 
See, when you're formless, you can take the shape of something like that. So even in your relationships, be it at the job, be it in a love relationship, and be it with your family, never let them see you coming. Take on different shapes just for fun. Be that happy-go-lucky person one day, then be the serious person the next day. Be that very intuitive person. Even if you're not that damn smart, look like it. And you will get that respect. This is the essence of this particular law. Take heed. Chapter 11. The law that we're working with now in the book is law number 36. This stain, things you cannot have, ignoring them is the best revenge. By acknowledging a petty problem, you give it existence and credibility. The more attention you pay on an enemy, the stronger you make him. And a small mistake is often made worse or more visible when you try to fix it. It is sometimes best to leave things alone. If there is something you want but cannot have, show contempt for it. The less interest you reveal, the more superior you seem. This is a difficult one for a lot of people. Because we want to let people know what we want. We feel like it is our duty in life to let people know what it is we want and need. I got to have that. I got to have that person. I don't know what I would do without that person. But you look very weak. You see, we forget that when people see that, people aren't seeing a person that's persistent. They see someone who is lacking something. Lack in itself is a weakness. And basically, what people see are the question that comes back into people's minds, even if they don't realize it is something must be wrong with you. There must be a reason why you can't have this thing. Something is wrong with you. But see, when you ignore it, ignore what you want, or at least don't make it apparent, make it look like you don't care about it, then you look superior. You see that person that you really want to be with who doesn't want you, the more you make them know that you want them, the more they're irritated by you. And the more that everyone else who's watching that whole phenomena, seeing you wanting them and them not wanting you, you look very silly. Very, very, very silly. And it's unbecoming. You ever wonder why when somebody dumps you? Never happened to me, but I know the feeling <laughs> in other realms. But you realize how good they look when they get rid of you and they move on. They look superior. Now think about you. When they dump you, if you go ahead and move on and act like you don't want them anymore and just make it look like you're doing great, you all of a sudden look great to them too. They, they begin to regret getting rid of you just for the simple fact that it looks like you're having a great time it looks like you got with someone better than them even if you didn't you need to make it look that way especially if for whatever silly reason you might want to get back with this person the way to do it is not looking silly and sad just look like okay and move on even if you haven't, you need to look like it. That's why these are laws. They're not real truths all the time. Sometimes it's an appearance. Sometimes you have to use deception and magic to get what you want. You see, when you get fired from a job and someone else picks you up and it looks like you're making that other company more money, somebody, the person who fired you might get in trouble. But if you play it the other way and try to beg for your job back, you make him look like he made the right decision. You see, when you leave and say, thank you, I was happy to get up out of here because someone else wants to pay me more. You make them try to rethink. Did I mess up? See, you have power 
over people and circumstances when you no longer put all of your attention into it. There was a part of the law that says if you make a mistake and you try to fix it, you make it worse. You ever notice whenever you made a mistake, it might be a certain small mistake. It might have been a spelling mistake. It might have been a picture that you drew and you colored. You did something wrong, but nobody noticed until you said something about it. Hmm. That ever happened to you? I'm a painter by trade. There's a lot of times where I was like, man, they're not going to like this. I think that the way that I mixed this paint, this particular wall looks a shade off of this other wall right next to it. But with me forgetting that since it's a new wall and it's right next to it, it naturally, the mind doesn't notice because the mind thinks it's just a, a shadow on that wall. It, the mind knows that once you stop at this wall and start another one, no one knows but the painter that that paint is really a different color. Even another painter coming in will not know the difference. But when you acknowledge it and say, I'm going to fix that for you. You know, say I messed up right here. It all of a sudden looks bad. You don't know why you're the one who made it look bad. You created that. It was perfect when they first looked at it. But not, what do they say? Now that you mention it, blah, blah, blah. Think about every single time that you have messed up something and then you acknowledge it and tried to fix it when you should have left it alone where people say, now that you mention it, now you got more work to do. Well, I finished this. I finished this project. I guess I could have done a little bit better with this one because you're thinking that they're going to find out about it. You're thinking you're being proactive by letting them know, but you have actually actually just messed yourself up. I finished all of these 139 files that took me four months to complete. Whereas this one file number five that I might need to redo. Oh, don't worry about it, but now that you mention it, which which file is that? You didn't want them to ask that question, but you gave them the power to do that. Oh, it's the one about, um, you know, the expenditures for from three years ago. Well, go ahead and fix it. That one file took four months. It took you four months for the whole project, but that one file, there were certain things missing, and you had to travel all across the country. You had to get documents from other parts of the world that people didn't feel like faxing you. It took you four months to get it done, and it would have been okay. But you tried to fix something that didn't need to be fixed. So you, in actuality, broke it. It wasn't even broken. You messed it up. <laughs> you gave yourself much more work because you should have shut up. You knew it was done. You knew it really didn't need to be messed with. You know your job. You know what you're doing. But sometimes when you put it out there, the person above you has to act now. In the back of their mind, it's like, why did he even say that? Now I have to reprimand him on that because everybody's looking at me. I have to tell him to go back and fix it when I didn't even care about it. Why did he tell me about this stupid file? There's something wrong with him. If he would have just left it alone, it would have been fine. But now, instead of us having a big conversation about how great he is for doing all of these projects, now I got to reprimand him and say, don't come here with incomplete work. He has to do you like that because you brought it to him that way. You brought him something and said, here you go. This is messed up, but here you go. Instead of saying, this is complete, and I know it's complete. If you have any questions, call me. But I know it's complete. No one would have ever cared about that one file, but you messed it up. Also, that job that you say you want so bad, stop saying it. Let your actions speak for itself. Now, I'm sure you've that we're coming to the end of this audio book, you should understand that a lot of these laws work in tension with each other. Not speaking too much. Not outdoing the master. Not showing your true cares, your true notions. Keeping those things concealed. All of them come into play, even with this law right here. 
Don't show everybody what it is you really want. Ignore it. And that's what you will get. You can use the other law that says, um, don't be around it too much. See those things that you really want. Somebody will say, oh, why not give it to them? See, that's what you do in the absence of even things that you want. Please, please take heed. This law of power is very important. Thank you. Chapter 12 and the final chapter. The last law I would like to impart upon you in this last chapter is one of the most important ones that will help you with all of the laws we are talking about today. Because I know a lot of you feel like you can't do this. Maybe you're too old. Maybe it's too late. You're already married. Whatever the case. This is law 25 in the book. Recreate yourself. Do not accept the roles that society foists on you. Recreate yourself by forging a new identity. One that commands attention and never bores the audience. Be the master of your own image rather than letting others define it for you. Incorporate dramatic devices into your public gestures and actions. Your power will be enhanced and your character will seem larger than life. Now, I want to repeat those for you because I want you to really, 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 really get this. This is Law 25. Recreate yourself. Do not accept the roles that society foists on you. That means I don't care if you were born crippled. I don't care if you were born black. I don't care if you were born white. I don't care if you were born a Native American on a reservation. I don't care if you were just a woman, a female, and I can't do it. I don't care. That's society's role for you. Recreate yourself by forging a new identity. Sometimes you change your name. I don't care if other people don't get it. I don't care if when you change your name, people feel like you're not being for real. What's the name on your birth certificate? It really doesn't matter. You create yourself. One that commands attention and never bores the audience. Why do you think different movie stars change the name? Because the name Frank Johnson may not be the name that everybody will spend a million dollars to come see. You have to figure that out and you have to understand the power of having a name and an identity. See, we go to McDonald's, we go to Burger King, but you wouldn't go to Burger Thing and slack Donald's, would you? Be the master of your own image rather than letting others define it for you. This is extremely powerful. When people define it for you, think about it. Maybe they want you a slave. Maybe they want you to be homeless. Maybe they want you to be without money. Maybe they want you to be without love. Maybe they want you to be divorced. So if you let other people define your image, what if it's something that you just don't want? Incorporate dramatic devices in your public gestures and actions. People need to remember you. People need to know you. When you walk into the office, people want to say, hey, how are you doing? You don't want to be that person that people forget about. Because when it's time to think of people, when they say, who are we going to give this money to? You want your name to be at the top of the list. Who are we going to give this job to? Who are we going to give this acting role to? This lead singing role to? You want to make sure that your name is the first one they think of. Your power will be enhanced and your character will seem larger than life when you do and take heed to these and all of these laws of power. Now listen to that. Recreate yourself. Listen to these laws of power over and over again and when you get a chance, buy the book. The book is The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Take heed. Take heed, please, and use, utilize these laws of power in your own lives. 
This last one is very powerful. That's why I made it for last. Now, of course, they all are powerful when they're all used in conjunct together. But this one is very interesting because for you to even pick up this audio CD and play it for a lot of you, it took a big paradigm shift. You may not be that type to be buying a lot of self-help books and audios. You may not be that type that will go get a documentary and check it out to learn something. But you at least took that first step to redefine yourself. That is to be commended. That is to be praised because that is something to be honored. Recreate yourself. If you are usually that lonely, sad person, hang around happy people. And it will change. Don't outshine the people who are in your hierarchy. Because you need them. Do not argue with people. If all of those these things that you do that are against these laws change and redefine yourself. If you are always saying too much, say the less. Say the less. Because when you say the least, you are the one that will have true power. Sometimes you do have to hide your true intentions. If you're that type, I always got to say what's on my mind. I got to show people where I'm coming from. Do something different. This last law will help you to adhere to all of these laws that you have been breaking all of your life. Because you didn't understand the detriment that you've caused yourself by not adhering to them. If you the type to think you got to outshine the master, hopefully you understand that rule that says not to do it. Now, I hope you see that if you're the type that always has to do all the work. Now, hopefully you understand that there is a time in your life that you will have to have others to do the work for you. Also, if you need people to do things for you, you will learn how to appeal to that which they need. If you are trying to work through a certain situation, hopefully if you learn, if you are that type, well, I got to argue my point. Well, hopefully you understand that you can win through your actions and not through arguing. Also, if you're the type that think you have to help everybody that needs to be helped, hopefully you understand that infectious law that you do not want to be around people that have that infectious personality and they are unhappy and unlucky because those unlucky things will befall you. Also, we talked about being absent sometimes. If you feel like you're the type that's always got to be around the life of the party, sometimes you need to skip that next party. So that when that next party happens, they can say, hey, where's so-and-so? It's best to do that. Never let them expect you're going to be there. Yes, play the people's fantasies, disdain the things that you can't have, and assume formlessness. And this last one, recreate yourself. These are the laws of power. I gave you 12. Use them now and I guarantee you will change your life for the better. Please contact me. See me. You can call me. You can email me. Lorenzo McCoy, L O R E N Z O M C C O Y. The number is 360 at yahoo.com. If you're on Facebook, I am Lorenzo McCoy, also known as Larry B. McCoy Jr. Come see me, talk to me, share with me. Let me know how this has helped.